Have you ever wanted to be in a cartoon? They have it easier than we do, that's for sure. The characters in your favorite shows never seem to experience boring days, and the world around them always seems so wonderful and imaginative. Animation is an idealized, stylized form of reality, where anything can happen, and entertainment is at the forefront of the lived experience. If you're understanding the appeal behind what we're talking about, you'll definitely be interested in hearing about SCP-6080, a strange anomaly known as Eric's Cartoon Box. The story of Eric's Cartoon Box is elaborate and complex, but catalogs one of the Foundation's most imaginative and surreal anomalies on file. It started on Parawatch.net, a message board dedicated to the supernatural and paranormal that the Foundation likes to keep tabs on in their spare time. While sifting through countless fake posts about being abducted by aliens or hunting for Bigfoot, the Foundation noticed something less conventional that caught their eye. A series of posts that talked about a cursed VHS tape of the mid-90s classic Nickelodeon cartoon Rocco's Modern Life. Now, a cursed cartoon seems like your standard internet horror fiction fare, something the Foundation could easily dismiss as a story crafted by an amateur author, but what caught their attention were the pictures of strange entities that appeared as a result of watching the tape, as well as information on how the original poster obtained the tape. It seemed oddly specific. A tape purchased on eBay through a seller named Toon Collector. The Foundation conducted a brief investigation, and found that Toon Collector was a resident of Bakersfield, California, named Jacob Sawyer, who had gone missing some time in the past. Inside his house, the Foundation found several VHS tapes and DVD cases, as well as a television. A hard drive on Sawyer's computer contained 161 hours of brief edited videos, all reviewing and commenting on various cartoons. Seems like Sawyer had a video essay hobby. But the Foundation was unable to locate any of this content on major video hosting sites. In Sawyer's basement, the Foundation discovered a large, worn-out cardboard box. On its right side were the words, Eric's Cartoon Box, written in black Sharpie. On its front was a simplistic smiley face, also drawn in Sharpie. Originally, the Foundation thought it was just an ordinary box, but the object quickly proved itself to be alive capable of speaking despite a lack of vocal cords, and also possessing a large degree of mobility, propelling itself short distances to move. When the Foundation first came across SCP-6080 in Sawyer's basement, the object was clearly distressed. SCP-6080 and all of the other items found were taken into Foundation custody and moved to Site-433, where they would be researched by Dr. Rowan Raster, one of the Foundation's leading figures in the study of animated, anomalous media and art. Raster's research found that SCP-6080, when emotionally distressed, could bend reality to alter their surroundings, which were transformed into reflections of its psyche. Raster discovered that there were a few ways to pacify SCP-6080, but the most practical method was to evoke a sense of nostalgia in the object by placing it in a familiar environment. To ensure that the box is kept passive, SCP-6080 is kept inside a containment chamber resembling a child's bedroom, an environment SCP-6080 finds comforting. On top of their reality-bending abilities, SCP-6080 also produces DVDs and VHS tapes, labeled SCP-6080-1. The Foundation would later discover that the tapes found within Sawyer's home and the cursed Rocco's Modern Life tape discussed on Parawatch.net were all products of SCP-6080. But what's so special about the cartoon reproductions made by 6080? On the outside, they're unaltered copies of animated children's television shows and films, and their contents are exactly the same as their ordinary counterparts. However, once an instance of SCP-6080-1 is viewed, the subject watching it will experience a reality-altering anomalous experience, dubbed by the research team as a rerun event. Sometimes the rerun event occurs immediately, though research has shown that as much time as three weeks can pass before one occurs. Rerun events often reflect visual or thematic elements of the media that induced them, and their severity ranges from inconsequential to dangerous and harmful to their subjects. Because of the variety found in a rerun event's content, it is difficult to generalize them. 
but we'll be sure to get into the specifics of a few later on. Still, if the event isn't immediately dangerous to the subject, the Foundation discovered that a rerun event may leave involved persons with lingering physical and psychological alterations, some of which are unable to be fully alleviated or treated, even with amnestics. Soon after SCP-6080 was brought into Site-433 and the immediate characteristics of the anomaly were recorded, an interview between the box and researcher Rowan Raster was held. Rowan tried to make sure that the anomaly was as comfortable as possible, but SCP-6080 continued to shuffle against the floor rapidly, unsettled in their new environment. SCP-6080 wanted to get out, and the object continued to stress themselves out, to the point where its speech degraded into unintelligibility. The lights in the containment chamber began flickering on and off, and the face on the front of the box rapidly flipped between different expressions. Rowan tried to continue to get through to SCP-6080, and eventually they began to speak. They said that they were scared, and that they missed someone that they called Eric. SCP-6080 once calmed down explained that Eric was the center of their universe. In their own words, SCP-6080 felt when it first started existing that their sole purpose for being here on Earth was to exist for Eric. They remembered waking up in a bedroom filled with toys and posters, and immediately knowing the feeling that they knew what they were made for, and who they were made by. At first, this was overwhelming, and SCP-6080 began to freak out, but Eric showed concern, and the box realized that they didn't want to upset him. The most important thing for SCP-6080 was to not upset Eric. When Raster asked if they could describe Eric, the box was unable to and said that whenever they tried to talk about Eric's appearance, people became confused. They said that Eric's skin was blue, and that he had a purple nose, with dark red eyes and four thin strands of hair on top of his head. From the way they described Eric, he sounded exactly like a cartoon character. Raster asked if this was how SCP-6080 always saw people, and that seemed to be the case. SCP-6080 then explained how they used their abilities to make Eric happy, namely through producing tapes of Eric's favorite cartoons and then playing inside the worlds of the shows together. And this continued for a while. SCP-6080 and Eric would meet the characters from their favorite shows and adventure through their worlds, and the two developed a powerful bond. But eventually, as SCP-6080 explained, Eric left. One day, the box woke up, and their friend was gone. SCP-6080 even searched for Eric's friends, but found that they were gone too. Without Eric, SCP-6080 was alone, and they panicked. They ran outside the house and began asking anyone they could find if they knew where Eric went. Naturally, the people SCP-6080 spoke to were terrified, and SCP-6080 quickly became overwhelmed by the chaos of the outside world. And then they found Jacob Sawyer. Sawyer was, at first, just as scared of SCP-6080 as everyone else was. But once SCP-6080 opened its flaps and revealed a trove of old tapes, Sawyer smiled to himself and told the box that it would be useful before picking them up and taking them to his house. SCP-6080 was scared and attempted to flee from Sawyer. The more time the box spent with Sawyer, the sicker it felt. When Sawyer threw the box in the empty, white walls of his basement, SCP-6080 was forced by Jacob to open themselves up and produce tapes. For months, this is how SCP-6080 lived, alone in a white-walled room with white floors and white ceilings, being forced open and used as a dispenser for the tapes, which Sawyer would sell online. SCP-6080 stopped their account and began crying a substance that resembled blueberry syrup. Raster put a stop to the interview, realizing that the object was clearly experiencing a form of trauma. After a break, Raster asked SCP-6080 if they knew what happened to Sawyer. The box explained that one day, Sawyer rushed down into the basement and demanded SCP-6080 to explain what it was doing to the cartoons it made. Apparently, some of the buyers were realizing that SCP-6080's tapes were anything but normal. Sawyer brutalized the box and pulled the DVD from inside them. But when Sawyer watched the DVD for himself, all SCP-6080 heard from beneath the living room was a sharp burst of static and a horrible scream. After that, 
Jacob was gone. SCP-6080 couldn't recall what tape they had produced that caused Sawyer to disappear, nor was one matching the box's description found inside the house. After the interview, the Foundation began its testing with SCP-6080 inside its containment chamber. SCP-6080 would produce a tape, a D-Class personnel would watch it, and the ensuing rerun event was recorded. During testing, SCP-6080 was escorted from the room so as to not cause it emotional distress. Most of these tests were routine. A D-Class would watch an episode of a cartoon, such as Chalk Zone or The Rugrats, and strange, reality-altering events would occur. For example, after watching an episode of The Rugrats where Chucky had difficulty differentiating his dreams from reality, D-1711 experienced a rerun event in which he was disoriented. D-1711 claimed everything in the room looked tall and that they needed to sleep off the effects of the anomaly. After laying in the bed, the chamber's lights turned blue and purple and a humanoid entity wearing a researcher's outfit was seen facing the corner of the room, against the wall. The figure disappeared as quickly as it appeared, with laughter heard in the distance. As soon as the figure was gone, D-1711 jolted awake and began screaming. After this, the researcher observing the experiment rushed in, and like a concerned parent, began comforting D-1711. The researcher assured the D-Class that nothing in a dream could hurt them, because it isn't real, which was a direct quote from the Rugrats episode D-1711 watched. After this, the D-Class and the researcher came out of their trance state, wondering how they got inside the containment chamber and what they were doing there. The rerun event had finished, and D-1711 explained that while they were asleep, they dreamed events similar to the dream shown in the Rugrats episode. This is just one example of how odd and surreal rerun events can be. Another test involving an obscure cartoon by the name of King, resulting in the entirety of Site-433 undergoing changes that made it look as if it were a location from the show itself. However, the most notable rerun event occurred when the Foundation tested a tape of Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, a special featuring cartoon characters from various shows banding together to talk about the dangers of children using drugs. In order to conduct this test, D-9926 was sent to a quarantine community away from Site-433 with only a helmet-mounted camera and a communication headset. Ten hours after watching the tape, D-9926 slept inside a bedroom of the vacant building the Foundation had brought him to. He was woken by the sound of a doorknob jittering and then several knocks. D-9926 got up from the bed and opened the door to find four crude-looking entities resembling cartoon characters from the special. One was Kermit the Frog, who was puppeteered by a man in a gray hoodie. Another was a cardboard cutout of Bugs Bunny. There was a tall mascot-like Garfield costume and a sentient elf plush. The four entities crowded D-9926 and began singing to him in a shrill, high-pitched voice a song about the dangers of doing drugs. D-9926 was confused, but the trance induced by the anomaly made it difficult for him to think straight. Then from the open windowsill in the room came a black boot attached to a long leg. A fifth entity made its way into the room, crawling through the windowsill. It was a tall, gray-skinned humanoid with wrinkled trousers, a creased shirt, and a large necktie. As much as D-9926 could understand, the gray entity was not from a cartoon. The gray entity signaled D-9926 towards them, and the two left the building and the strange cartoon entities behind. Outside, the environment was strange. It was dark out, with only dim streetlights illuminating the spaces between trees at a low angle. The asphalt path the duo walked on slowly transitioned to a field of grass. The gray entity explained that the very nature of the environment was built around the message of the cartoon, which was trying to get D-9926 to avoid using drugs. Somehow, D-9926 needed to find a way to get out. As the two moved through the forest area, D-9926 and the Grey Entity continued to recognize something was wrong. Grey explained that it didn't understand where they were either, and that's when D-9926's rerun event began altering reality. It was pulled away from the place it regularly existed, and into reality. D-9926 did not understand, 
but he was short on options. Both of them smelled something horrible, and the area around them was starting to resemble the real world less and less. The sky above the forest was smoky orange-red, and in the distance, Dean9926 could see a luminescent object resembling a window recessed into a concrete wall. The two also heard music, and as they moved through this dreamlike world, they came across a building in the distance, which was small enough for them to climb the roof of. On the roof there appeared to be a parking lot, and beyond it more forest, as if they never elevated from the ground in the first place. The two continued walking. As the parking lot sloped downwards, they recognized what appeared to be a city in the distance. Dean knew that with the altered state of reality, this city was going to be anything but normal, but he felt compelled to keep moving. It was the only thing the two of them could do. Dean9926 and the Grey Entity began talking about the nature of the reality they found themselves in, and the Entity explained that it felt that trusting its gut and exploring anything that stood out was probably the right thing to do in a place that made little actual sense. They concluded that the location they were inside had some sort of feelings and goals, and they just had to go along with its own internal logic in order to find a way out. In the distance, the red lights of the city twinkled in the darkness. They continued walking. After 30 minutes, the red lights of the city illuminated all of their surroundings, and they began to see the edifices of concrete buildings on the other side of the road they were walking on. D9926 didn't notice them at first, but when the entity pointed them out, D9926 realized they were standing in the middle of a mass of buildings, with rubble and litter strewn on the streets beneath them. Gray wondered if they could use them as shelter. The two didn't realize that they were being watched by a figure in the distance. D9926 was still confused. The city was empty. Gray seemed oddly optimistic about their situation, and things weren't looking like they were going to return to normal anytime soon. Gray commented that they were somewhat interested in exploring a location different from the realities and dreams they were used to exploring. After minutes of nothing, the duo came across a dead body laying on top of a rusted metal wheelbarrow. D9926, who was familiar with seeing sights like these, sighed and continued moving. Gray told him he could simply walk away into the darkness where they could forget about this place and emerge somewhere else. D9926 wondered if the entity really had that power. They came across more bodies and continued forward. If this entity could really whisk D9926 away to another place, he was seriously considering it. Life as a D-Class was unimaginably dehumanizing. The figure watching the two of them continued to observe from a rooftop. Suddenly, a large sheet metal shelving unit fell from the overhanging roof of a building, tipped from its edge by the observing figure. The shelving unit hit Gray directly and severely injured the entity on impact. D9926 ran. He ran through the buildings, only catching glimpses of the orange figure wielding a thick pipe running across the rooftops beside him. The chase continued through the insides of the buildings, and once D9926 caught a glimpse of the pursuing figure, he ran back out. The entire time, he heard the figure's high-pitched breathing audibly chasing after him. More bodies, more red lighting, and endless city, all while being pursued. D9926 found rest inside a warehouse, which he ran through in an attempt to escape the entity. At the far side of the warehouse was a room resembling SCP-6080's containment chamber, but heavily damaged and littered with trash. The television set in the room switched on showed an all-white room, similar to the basement SCP-6080 was found in. The door to the room was about to be opened, and D9926 screamed before smashing the TV with a book he threw from across the room. Upon shattering the screen, the camera feed went dark. When it resumed, D9926 found himself in a red, misty area, with a figure that had been pursuing him standing right in front of him. The two stared at each other, before the figure lunged forward at D9926. But then, it suddenly stopped, and the voice of SCP-6080 was heard. The box called out to the figure, which it recognized as something that resembled Jacob Sawyer. SCP-6080 ordered the Sawyer entity to leave D9926 alone, except this time, SCP-6080 wasn't a cardboard box. 
They were a pale-skinned child, drawn like a cartoon, wearing ordinary clothes. The box realized that this place was a manifestation of its own traumatic experience, as it slowly realized that the entity resembling Sawyer was stuck in its own mind. The box and the entity fought each other, punching with large cartoon-like fists, until the Sawyer entity fell to the ground, coughing up blood. SCP-6080 realized that this wasn't actually Sawyer. Like everything, this was all a manifestation of the damage that Sawyer caused. And with that, the entity left its own body, flattening until all that was left was its empty skin. D-9926 thanked SCP-6080 for saving him, and the two introduced themselves to one another. SCP-6080 offered to take D-9926 away from the Foundation forever. He took off his recording equipment, and the two walked away into the sunset. Inside SCP-6080's containment chamber, the object and D-9926 were nowhere to be found. Instead, there was a single disc containing a message from SCP-6080 to the Foundation. SCP-6080 told the Foundation that they were coming to terms with what they experienced in their life, and that now they were in a place where they could exist without issue. Behind them was a playground, where SCP-6080 could act like a kid again, something they never got to experience as much as they wanted to. They told the Foundation that D-9926 was safe and happy somewhere else and that they shouldn't look for either of them, because they'd never find them. For now, all SCP-6080 needed to do was to play on the swings and live at peace with themselves, until they could grow up. Inside the disc that the message was contained on was a sticky note that simply read, I hope you understand. Now go check out SCP-3082 Neverland's Lost Boys and Girls, and SCP-974 Treehouse Predator, for more of the SCP Foundation's anomalous child's play.